Good afternoon, and welcome to today's installment of the 2022 January series. We are grateful to have you here. My name is Isaac Seiler, and I'm a sophomore at Calvin University, studying politics, social work, and African studies. I'm also a research assistant at the Henry Institute here on campus. Would you please take a second to silence your cell phones? I would now like to extend a warm welcome to our guests from our 50 simulcast viewing locations across the United States and across the world, particularly those viewing from Redlands, California, Wyckoff, New Jersey, and Fremont, Michigan. To all of our attendees, virtual and in person, we are glad that you are here. Please join me now in a word of prayer. Gracious God, we live in a broken world. We live in a world where our systems of government are often dysfunctional, where relationships and families are fractured over political beliefs, and where there is not nearly enough nuance in our conversations with others. Lord, I pray that today we would learn more about how to step into a broken society with constructive dialogue. Help us learn today about ways that we can bring healing to our families, churches, and communities as your agents of renewal on earth. Thank you for bringing these women to Calvin, and I pray that our hearts and our minds would be open to hear what they have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, Alicia Sinclair, a recent Calvin Board of Trustee member, will introduce our speakers. Good afternoon, everyone. I am truly honored to introduce today's January series speakers, Sarah Stewart Holland and Beth Silvers, the co-hosts of the popular news and politics podcast, Pantsuit Politics. Sarah and Beth started Pantsuit Politics in 2015 with a desire to take a different approach to the news. They analyze current events and different political viewpoints with curiosity, nuance, and grace. And their show has cultivated an online community of listeners who engage with the Pantsuit Politics team and have respectful civic dialogue with each other. Pantsuit Politics has been featured in the New York Times, The Atlantic, C-SPAN's Washington Journal, The Guardian, and MSNBC's Morning Joe, among other publications and news outlets. Last year, the show was one of 10 podcasts to be included in Apple Podcasts' Best of 2021 list. In addition to Pantsuit Politics, Sarah and Beth have co-authored two books. Their first book, I Think You're Wrong, But I'm Listening, A Guide to Grace-Filled Political Conversations, will be available to purchase after today's discussion. And their second book, Now What? How to Move Forward When We're Divided, will be published in May. Sarah and Beth attended Transylvania University in Kentucky and then law school at American University and the University of Kentucky, respectively. Sarah previously worked as a congressional staffer, a campaign aide, a blogger, a social media consultant, and a city commissioner in Paducah, Kentucky, where she lives with her husband and three sons. Beth began her career as a lawyer and later worked as a human resources executive and business coach. She lives in Union, Kentucky with her husband and two daughters. Calvin University is grateful to the Henry Institute for the Study of Christianity and Politics for underwriting today's conversation, and Sarah will be available to greet the audience in the west lobby of the Covenant Fine Arts Center after the event. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Sarah Stewart Holland and Beth Silvers. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. We are so honored to be here for the January series. Christy and her incredible team, Isaac, Alicia, have been so kind. I just had a very exciting, exhilarating conversation with the honors class for the January series. As you can see, we've had a slight change of plans. Beth, do you want to tell the people why you are on a screen today? Yes, this is certainly not how I hope to be joining you. I am here on campus, but I am in my hotel room because we were very kindly greeted with rapid tests when we checked in. And I have had two positive tests. It's been unexpected and unfortunate, but 
I am amazed at how adaptable and flexible and uh, hospitable the Calvin team has been and so grateful that we uh, had the flexibility for me to still be with you in some form. Yeah, the system worked. That's what we learned, right? The system of protection has worked. Um, and so we're just so grateful for their adaptability and we're so thrilled still to be here with you talking about thriving through disagreement. So let's talk about that. Um, okay, look, we're not going to tell you anything you don't already know. It's a lot of disagreement out there in America today. Uh, lots of conflict, lots of misinformation, um, lots of societal all the way down to family level disagreement. You know, we hear from our audience all the time. I'm not talking to this family member anymore. I not going to my church anymore. I don't feel comfortable in my entire town. You know, our, our book that Alicia was so kindly introducing, our second book, Now What?, is because after we wrote this book, I think you're wrong, but I'm listening. People are like, okay, I did that. Still in disagreement. Now what? <laughs> and so that's where the title came from, Now What? And so that, that environment, like we say, it's just, it's the air we breathe right now. And it has always been so. You know, we hear very often that we're living in unprecedented times. We, we posted a tweet that was joking about how we could all use some precedented times for a second. <laughs> um, but the truth is, and what I hope our books um, really lean into, is that we've always had serious disagreements. We always will have serious disagreements. We should always have serious disagreements. And so what we need to be able to do is find the value in those serious disagreements, and we need to calibrate those disagreements to be of a type that bring us closer together instead of driving us further away from each other. You know, we were recently on the um, campus of the University of Alabama, and you see this in college campuses all the time. This, this disagreement is the air we breathe. It's not just like societal like you get all the way down into a university environment. At the time we were at the University of Alabama, y'all, they were having like a stop the steal situation about the homecoming queen. I'm not making this up. Um, and we were like, wait, what? Um, but it was true. Tell us was, everything. We want to know every detail of that. Yeah, 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 exactly. You do. That's a whole other talk. You could give a whole talk on that situation. Um, but like when we, when we step into something as small as to like my campus is fighting around the homecoming queen to something like COVID and mask wearing, we're carrying so much into that disagreement, right? And I think especially, you know, for the students here in the audience are listening, there's this sense in a university that we're the same age, we're like the same grade, right? And so we are the same, but we are not. Even if you're talking about two college sophomores in disagreement inside a classroom setting, they are carrying so much into that disagreement. You know, even if they're the same age, they're carrying disagreement about disability or about ability. But let's say even with age, who's seen Encanto, the new Disney Plus film? Mm -hmm. I mean, the central villain of that movie is generational disagreement. What a brilliant stroke, like what a stroke of genius to bring that to a film environment because there is a lot of disagreement in our country right now, generationally. There's a lot of generational conflict. There's a lot of conflict around demographics. If we come at something, you know, even from the same um, age, well, am I the same age? Am I a 20-year-old coming from California? Am I a 20-year-old coming from Kentucky? Like, those are completely different cultures. We're about to have an author on our podcast named Colin Woodard, and he's done this brilliant thing where he breaks up the United States into these 13 regions and talks about, like, the cultural differences between something like New England and Appalachia are enormous. You guys know that up in the upper Midwest. That's a whole different environment than say, oh, I don't know, Texas. Heck, Texas has like four different of his regions just within its state's borders. So when we walk into these conversations, even if we feel like we have similar experiences or we look the same on paper, we're carrying so many differences into those disagreements with us. And there are layers and layers of complexity, even as you dig down further into what makes a life and how I might describe myself to someone, um, understanding the particular journey each person takes to get where they are is something that's hard for all of us to do. I love this image of the backpack because it reminds me that it's hard to unpack our own experiences that inform our politics. It took over a year of 
hosting a political podcast with Sarah for me to understand the extent to which growing up on a small dairy farm in Western Kentucky informed my politics. It took conversation after conversation to really pry past like a policy position to get to, here is the story that I've been telling myself um, that informs that policy position. And so even in our own backpacks, there is a ton to dig into. If we can't fully unpack our own stuff, then it's important to remember that we cannot do that for someone else. We make a lot of assumptions, like I can dig right into your bag and see what's going mm -hmm. on, but, mm -hmm. but we can't do that. And so remembering that everyone is coming with their own story, their own set of experiences, their own level of awareness about what they're carrying around, their own set of assumptions around what they think we're carrying around. I had this conversation with a friend of mine recently where I said, I think we should just wake up every morning and say, I don't know the rock in your shoe. Like, I just don't know the rock in your shoe. And I think with partisanship in particular, which has become so identity driven in America, those stories Beth were talking about, even to ourselves, are so blinding. I was telling the honors class, somebody asked, excuse me, <clears throat> the honors class asked, is there something you've changed your mind on? And I said, well, one of the biggest sort of dramatic aha moments I've had since hosting the podcast is we do series called Five Things You Need to Know. We used to call them primers, where we'll, we'll start with a topic that we all think we know and understand, and we'll just keep digging at the history. And we did welfare. And I had been a, a very good Democrat for going on, you know, 15, 20 years at this part, and I definitely thought that I understood welfare. And I was very defensive of it because that is what I had been trained to do through my partisan identity. And we did this podcast about the history, and I realized I knew nothing about the history of welfare in this country. I knew even less about the current state of welfare in this country, um, particularly as it changes from state to state. And that, that posture of curiosity, again, not just of what other people carry into the conversation, but what I was carrying into the conversation was really informative. And it, and it when you come into curiosity about your own story, it, it sh throws you off balance just enough. Like, no one's like, you know, dramatically upending their entire narrative, but like, just enough that you're open to what other people bring into the conversation. And not to get a little woo-woo on you here, but it is like our own individual galaxies. Like every single one of us, between all those things we just listed, family history, cultural identity, geographic location, work history. My stepdad had a bad experience with a union in the 70s and he is still not over it. Okay. Like that informs all of his policy positions on labor. And I'm like, every time I'm like, that was so, that was before I was born and I'm 40. Can we like, maybe he's like, no, it's just like, he is in it still in that story. Um, and that's just that complexity of not only all those layers of experiences, but how they interact and then how we come with each galaxy and how they kind of run into each other it's just a lot. It is a lot. It's not, we're not carrying a rock in our shoe. We're carrying like two cups of gravel. And how all of those experiences run into moments in time. Mm -hmm. You know, the pandemic has been a very different experience for me than it has for Sarah, I think, because very early in the pandemic, my mother got COVID and was in the hospital and we thought we would lose her. There were about four days when I was pretty sure I would not see my mom again. And that just changes your perspective, even though Sarah and I have pretty similar relationships with our families. We're both very close to our family of origin. We have good, healthy relationships with our moms. Like you could check, check, check down this list of things in that backpack, but this one moment in time really altered our perception of a global event. And so remembering that is helpful. The big aha for me in that welfare conversation that I want to come back to because it illustrates some more of the things in that backpack I walked into our discussion on welfare, our first discussion on welfare, with a very conservative posture. Federal government cannot solve everyone's problems. When you try to implement one rigid federal approach for every family, you're going to end up with lots of um, externalities to that that are undesirable. And what I came to in the course of our conversation, where we tried to explicitly name our values first, what values were instilled, instilled in us by our faiths, by um, the reasoning that we've done as adults, I realized I really don't care if people cheat the system. I, I am comfortable 
with some people, some limited number of people, a limit that I cannot control or put a cap on, but I am comfortable with some number of people abusing a system if that system is ultimately actually pulling more people out of living conditions that are unacceptable here in modern America. And that was a real revelation for me, just connecting two different pieces of my own personal galaxy that I hadn't connected before uh, softened significantly a policy position that I had held. Well, because I think that what you're naming is so important is that that moment is hard, right? That moment when you're like, oh, I didn't understand this. I was wrong about this. Um, maybe I feel differently about this. It is very hard, no matter how old you are, no matter what you're carrying in your backpack. But what is also true is it gets, if not more, if not easier, a little more comfortable every time you do it. Because you realize like, oh, I bumped up against the edge of my own story and I walked past it and everything was okay. And I continued to learn and we continued to be in conversation. It's not like I screamed at Beth in that moment, like, you're a hypocrite, I'm done. Um, or she, got, she was like, I see, I knew you were wrong about that, so what else are you wrong about? There was no gotcha. That's the grace component we're going to get to in a minute, right? Like you ha when we give grace to each other to say, I don't know, I was wrong, the story I was telling myself about was not quite accurate, and we see that we can receive grace in those moments, like that, that allows that adaptability. Um, it gives our brains input. That's what COVID has learned. That is what COVID has taught me, right, is that every experience is input. And depending on whether you live in New York City or Kentucky, that input is going to be dramatically different. You know, depending on whether your mother was in critical care and almost died, or my father, who on paper should have been very um, vulnerable to COVID, but got it and was fine. Like every single one of those things is a piece of input. And our brains are just trying to categorize that as best they can based on what's in, the, based on what's in that backpack. And it's really uncomfortable to develop some categories that challenge a list of attributes that you would have named about yourself before. And I think that part of the gift of learning in public, which is I hope first and foremost what Sarah and I do, uh, part of the gift of learning in public is that you develop a real resilience around that where you say, oh, well, this was my identity. Some people would say this, is my, this was my brand. Um, but here I've come to a, a realization, at least for this moment, um, that challenges that or even takes it apart and I'm still here and I'm still a person in good relationship with other people, in fact, in stronger relationship with other people because I've been willing to lean into this hard work. And I, I think that learning that I can overcome that personal brand um, has been the most important, the, the most important lesson in my life in the last 10 years, really. Now, let's talk to the students a little bit for a minute here because this, I think the real challenge when you're a student or when you're in the earlier part of your life is that you're trying to, to build that brand. You're trying to build that identity. All of us are to a certain extent, but certainly when you're in younger life, especially you know, if you're at school, you're getting grades. It's a very linear process where we're gonna come to a conclusion or your life might be occupied by extracurricular and sports. Again, very linear. I hear we have a rivalry game tonight. So it's like there's that, that process where it's, it's a beginning, it's an end, we're going to build this career. We're going to put something on the resume. We're going to get a grade. We're either going to win or lose the game. And so it feels like every message in your life is that you're trying to get to this permanent place. But there is no permanent place. There is no place where I remember very early, even in social media, which again is this very weird paradox of like everybody feeling like they need to take a stand that will disappear into the noise 15 minutes later or sooner, right? But I remember hearing a, a speaker one time that was like, it's not like anybody goes in the day and is like, I reached the end of Twitter. I'm done for today. You know, like, I did it. You certainly not true of TikTok. You can lose whole hours of your life on that thing. Um, but it's like that's that, that posture. It feels like we need to, we need to take, make the take. Where do I stand? And that's where I will stand forever on this position. What's my registration? What's my grade? What's this point on my resume? Even as we get older, I think there is so much of our culture that pushes us into 
this very linear, permanent posture. And so that's why it's really important to us and what we try to articulate on our show is like, but what, is that what we want? Or as Dr. Phil says, I don't quote Dr. Phil a lot, but I do like when he says, how's that working for us? Is it working? Like, are we happy with where we're at America? Like, do we feel really good about this posture and if it's serving us? What are we actually trying to do here? I was the most stressed of college students because I did feel that I had to get to an end and that I was marching on a ladder to get to that end and I was going to do it so brilliantly that people were going to say, you are the best adult we've ever seen. I really <laughs> believe that that was achievable for me and that I was well on my way. And she was good at it and she got lots of praise in college and that probably did not serve her. <laughs> no, that's right. I mean, uh, the curse of the competent is a real thing and mm -hmm. it will happen to you in any environment that you find yourself in for the rest of your life. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I wish I could go back and explain to myself the concept of seasons of life. Because all I ever wanted was to be successful, but I never had a very good definition of what being successful meant. And so now I think about success as aligning my time best I can with what's important to me in a particular season of life and building in room for that to change along the way. And there's so much freedom in that. Even now I'm, I'm a political podcaster. I mostly talk about my draft opinions because I want that room to learn more, to grow more, to see how an environment changes. That doesn't mean that there aren't important principles to me that I want to hold on to and carry along. But what I've realized is that those principles are much less specific than I led myself to believe early in life. And that it really is important for me to take everything that I've learned and experienced, everything I see around me, everything I'm constantly hearing from people I really care about and integrate that into my perspective on what makes a successful life. Well, and I think our political conversations would go a lot more smoothly if we gave that same grace to our institutions to say like, this institution is in a certain season because it feels like when we talk about academia or churches or even the government, we're like, again, it's very, we're gonna get it here and then we're gonna be good. Like we're gonna fix this problem and then there won't be any other problems and again, Dr. Phil, how's that working for us? You know, like I think our institutions are, are suffering under that very linear mindset. They're either going to be right, they're going to be wrong, they're going to be failing, or they're going to be succeeding, they're going to be crumbling. Like there's a lot of spectrum of opportunity experiences, possibilities between success and failure for our institutions and for ourselves. And some seasons are going to be seasons of growth and some seasons are going to be seasons of deconstruction. You know, that's why I'm a student of history and I think that's why history is so valuable. It's hard to get wrapped up in like, this is the end all be all election or moment in American history. When you go back and realize how absolutely wild things were in like 1890, it was crazy out in America in around 1890. And so I think just learning that, oh, there have been seasons before. There have been seasons of challenge. There have been seasons of growth. There have been seasons of renewal. And there have been seasons of deconstruction, both in our individual lives and because our institutions are composed of human beings inside the institutions themselves. And so when we reorient our goals that we're not trying to succeed or fail, we're not trying to reach this permanent place of flourishing, that what we're really trying to do is just live together in community, then that changes the tenor of conversations, much less ongoing relationships. So if my, my reality and therefore the adjustment to my goal is that I want to live in community with others and I start to think of politics as a mechanism to do that, then I have space in myself for that draft opinion. I have space in everyone else for that draft opinion. I have space for the CDC to adjust its guidance. Look, I thought some of those memes about the CDC's recommendations were funny. <laughs> but also, I need to understand that the role of the CDC as an institution right now is not to make the rules. It is to guide us as a community through an unknown time. And that gives me a lot more flexibility and a lot more patience. Do I think it's all perfect? No. Have I criticized them? Yes, here and there. But I do understand that this institution is not a failure because it hasn't made consistent rules that applied from March of 2020 through January of 2022. They're leading us. They are not governing us in the way that we typically think of what governing is. 
And that shift in what governing is then to helping us establish flexible flame frameworks for living in community together has really changed my orientation to what laws should do. Yeah, I think that when you, I don't know how many of you watched the hearings yesterday with like the CDC director and Dr. Fauci before the Senate. Such a human moment when the director of the CDC was like, I think we're all just going to get it. Like she just, you could see it. She was like, we're doing the best we can. This is a whole new world we're in. We're still calling it the COVID pandemic, but every strain is a new invention. And it was just such a human moment where she was basically like, we're doing the best we can, but I think maybe we're all just going to get it. Like it was so intense, I think, to realize like, again, we say things like the CDC or the campus or the church what does that even mean? Like, what does it mean when we, when we anthropomorphize institutions like that? Because all they are is a gathering of human beings trying to live in community together. And there is no permanent destination that we will reach where those institutions are done because they're always going to have people at the helm not finding this framework that will work forevermore but just helping us sail these seas that are going to, cons- that the only thing that's permanent is consistent change. And I think when we see, I mean, Beth early in our podcast said, politics is just about how we live together in community. And it, I felt like, makes me even a little teary to remember it because it just felt like the earth shifted. As someone who was a political science major who lived in Washington, D.C., where politics was win or lose, that's what politics was. Politics was win or lose. You're the bad guy. I'm the good guy. That's what politics was. And so when she said that, I thought, oh, right. It can be more than that. It's not just win or lose. It's not just win or take all. It's not just black and white. But it really is a, cult, a part of our culture, increasing even more so now. It's become so much of our identity and so much of our media environment, especially with social media. We're talking about how we feel about one another. And, you know, culture wins. Culture is powerful. And so what does our political culture say about how we feel about one another? And can we shift it more to a posture of we're living together in community? What does that mean? So another framework we developed early in the podcast to talk about who are we within that community? What are our roles? Sarah's pulling up a slide right now to say a community is like an ecosystem. So we were thinking about Who are we in this interconnected world? And what do our political identities mean to us? Because I don't want to have a conversation today that doesn't address the reality of living in a two-party system that's extremely polarized. So what we came to initially was that when it comes to the power of the United States government, Sarah is like the accelerator in a car. She sees big problems. She sees this big government that can bring big solutions. And she wants to put the gas down and do it. And I am more the brakes saying, whoa, when we bring government to a problem, we miss a lot of things. We put a solution in place that's hard to adapt down the road. There are lots of consequences to that. On the other hand, when it comes to private industry, I'm like the accelerator. Let's have people out there wanting to get rich, making big, amazing inventions. They can do it fast and adapt. Go, go, go. And Sarah is the brakes saying, hey, look at what happened with Facebook. Look at what's happened with um, big financial institutions that basically wrecked our economy because they weren't sufficiently regulated. That doesn't work either. And so between the two of us, we realized, oh, there's a ton of value in your initial orientation and a ton of value in mine. And when they work together, which means give and take, you cannot just press down on both of them at the same time and the car doesn't go anywhere if you slam only one of them, there's something that really works here. Now, we're living in a new age where that metaphor does not define the difference between the two parties anymore. And we got to figure that out. And that's why I think ecosystem has become more helpful to us because we understand there is a lot going on here. There are people who would say, this isn't even a car. What are you talking about? And shouting each other down about that doesn't help as much as saying, okay, what am I putting into this ecosystem? What am I contributing to the soil and to the river and to the air? How is that getting diluted? How is it getting changed over time? What am I taking in? How can we make this picture as healthy as possible for all of the things trying to live together within it? 
Well, you know what? I don't even think we need to move to the ecosystem. I think the car still works because there's a lot more to the car than the gas and the brakes. Uh, I don't know if we have any mechanics in the audience, but like that, that's not all there is to a car. It feels like it, go or stop, but there's not. There's a lot more going. And in a, even in a two-party system, it's never that simple. It is never the binary we want it to be. Um, you know, I'm an Enneagram one. I love a binary, but it just doesn't work like that. I think e again, even with a car, I mean, you have transmissions unless you're driving a Tesla, but like, you know, you have all these other pieces and components that really affect whether you're going forward or you're moving back. But that is why we move to the, the, the ecosystem is because it's so interconnected, even when it feels like it's a winner take all two party system. When you see the dramatic changes in our two-party system over the last couple of years, you can see play out very clearly that it was never the binary we thought it was, that it's always and forever going to be more complex because even in a two-party system, each of those parties is an ecosystem with complex, interconnected nature, and that they and the party system itself is an ecosystem. And so that's just with electoral politics. When you bring in the governance aspect of it, again, there's that, there's that galaxy, right, of just all these interconnected components. And I think in particular, this, the, the election gives us this sense of like, it's, this is the election. I don't know if y'all have ever heard this. This is the most important election of your lifetime. <laughs> um, they say that every time, every time. Um, and it's true in a way, right? In a democratic system where the p party in charge has a lot of power, it is the most important election of your lifetime, right? But then so is the next one. It's, we're never done. We're never going to meet this destination where we settle it. Even, you know, even in the 50s and 60s where you had one party in charge for decades, it's not like they didn't have any debate. It's not like there wasn't any, you know, cultural conflict in American society, right? Like you still have this this um, circular system that, and that's why we like the ecosystem, right? Where everything's contributing, everything's feeding off each other. And one rule isn't going to work for everything. You know, I look at this picture and I think about how we talk about policy. You know, even, you know, smart, thoughtful people that I love to read. And there's still this undercurrent of like, but we'll settle on one thing that'll work for everybody. There's no one rule of nature that works for the trees and the water and the dirt and the plants and the animals and the insects, right? Like everything plays its part and it all plays out differently. But I think as human beings, especially when we talk about politics, there's a sense of like, but there is a right answer that will work for all parts of these ecosystem. And we just have to keep learning over and over and over again that that is not how it works. Now, I'm a little confused about the kangaroo and the illustration. Yes, we are too. I just we just, the best one we can get off Google image. But what I really like about it is that it reminds me about what an individual means in an ecosystem, because we are not asking this random kangaroo to be a stand-in for all kangaroos in the world, <laughs> or to be a stand-in for all animals in the world, or all marsupials. It just gets to be its one kangaroo. And I think that that is the, the call to action that I always have for people around better political conversations, capturing the value of disagreement. We are stuck right now all trying to be a stand-in for every Democrat or every Republican or every Christian or every person from Kentucky or from Michigan or whatever your identity is. We don't have to represent anyone but ourselves because all of this value goes back to what's inside that backpack, the unpacking of our individual experiences, how we are individually and in all of those communities that have been formative for us, trying to make sense of what a good life is, that's where we get to the good parts of not agreeing with each other. And we can't do it if we're trying within that ecosystem to just represent the symbolism of some other bigger idea constantly. Well, and that is why we so believe in the role of grace, because the role of grace says that every individual belongs. Now, belonging does not mean you're right or you get to be in charge, okay? That's not what belonging means. But it does mean that we recognize your basic human dignity and the fact that this interconnected system is built on that belonging. And the grace that flows between us is the essential part of a healthy ecosystem. And that 
is very much lacking in our current political ecosystem, the belief that everybody belongs. In fact, in the conversation I was having with your honors class, you know, so much of the conflict is driven by, not only do I disagree with you, but you are the enemy. And nothing I can do is worse than what you are. And that is not an energy flow. That is an energy killer. That belief that whatever my side does doesn't matter because your side is worse is not grace. It is the opposite. And it, it feeds conflict. It feeds that linear thinking. It feeds that binary. It feeds the winner take all. And it breaks everything apart. It, it pushes us away from each other because we no longer belong to one another. We don't belong to one another. We are in opposition. You are a threat to me. And that sense of fear and anxiety is so dangerous inside our ecosystems. Like it is an invasive species. When people are afraid, when they feel scarcity, when they are anxious, when they want to profit off that fear and anxiety and scarcity, like it, it is like a zoo. It just takes over everything because it is the paradox of the, the human brain, right? That depends on interconnectedness, depends on community, and is therefore very easily tipped into tribalism and this sort of loyalty framework and this, this ability to see these people that we are connected to as threats. It, two things happen at once, right? It becomes that invasive species. It harms the ecosystem in that way, but it also prevents you from doing your work. One of the things that my faith um, so strongly influences in my political beliefs is the notion of calling. I, I believe that we each have a part to play in that greater ecosystem, that we have our work to do, that that work changes by season. But when we decide, I'm just going to inhabit the identity of a Democrat or a Republican or, or whatever, then I step away from that individual work that I'm there to do, and my calling is not fulfilled. And it breaks my heart to see how much of that is happening in American politics right now. And I think that's something that we really can choose to step away from in a way that's life-giving. You know, we had a really uh, transformative for me conversation with Dr. David Camp. He is the author of the White Ally Toolkit, and he talks a lot um, with white audiences about how to be allies around issues of systemic racism. And the thing he said that I will never forget was like, why are all these white people like canceling their uncles? <laughs> you are the person who has the relationship with your uncle to over time work on how he feels about people who look like me. And if you're not doing that, who's going to do that? And I thought that's right. You know, our unique callings, the relationships that we have, the opportunities that are in front of us, when we're in places, when we're safe, we're not being harmed, and we are able to use those relationships and a lot of patience to keep working on each other, that, that is a part of our calling. Um, and, and I thought that was a really beautiful encapsulation of this idea of an ecosystem where we're contributing and we're taking from each other all the time, and that's how it's meant to be. And I think what's so important is we've all thought and read, most of us, have talked about this long-term growth mindset as individuals. And what we really push people to think about is this can also be true of relationships and institutions. Like, it's not just us growing as individually, being curious, staying open, giving grace, but thinking about our relationships like this. Like, the one conversation, even with the uncle, is not the end. Right? Let's take a growth mindset to our connections to one another. That one conversation does not fully represent the relationship. That the relationship is ongoing. That it is, it is a constantly in a place of growth. And hopefully that is healthy growth that is fed with grace and interconnectedness. And that it's okay to say, I still think you're wrong. I'm listening. I still think you're wrong. Now what? Okay, well, now let's just take a break. Let's just take a break. We don't have to solve this. Beth always says, like, we're, no one's asking us for draft legislation from our Thanksgiving tables, okay? No one's looking for that. There are people that write that legislation. You do not have to do it with your family members at Christmas. Um, and so, like, we can take breaks. We can say, like, I learned a lot from this conversation. I'm glad we have it. I need a break right now. I'm feeling really upset. I'm feeling really angry even. But it doesn't mean I'm done talking to you. I still think this is really important. You know, I talk a lot about my dad tried to block me on Facebook, and I said, we're not going to do that today. I understand you're angry. We can talk about why we're having conflict, but we're not going to step away from each other. Um, now, there are some toxic relationships where that is called for, 
But I think if we take a growth mindset that like this is the connection, we focus so much on the conversation, forgetting that the conversation is taking place in the context of the connection, in context of the relationship with one another. And not just individual family members, inside the context of our congregations, inside the context of our classrooms, inside the context even of citizens as of states or of counties or of municipalities. When we look at that connection and think, is that connection growing or is that connection fading? Let's think about the growth mindset in that bigger context and be able to ask for what we need, be able to take breaks. And again, think about, is this my work to do right now? Sometimes the answer is no. You know, I can't, I can't be an activist on every single story that touches my heart. Like, that's not sustainable. That's not, a, that's, not a, that's not work to do. That's just a recipe for burnout. And so constantly asking yourself, like, I can care about this, especially as an Enneagram one, but I don't have to individually fix it. But keeping that, that the, co- the bigger context of our connection to each other and that growth mindset in mind. And how do you have connection when you're listening to someone who's saying things that sound abhorrent, obnoxious, ignorant. I'm not asking you to not have those thoughts in the context of your own brain. You are allowed (laughs) to be a human who has reactions to other people that are not all open arms and open hearted. We are asking you not to put that on Facebook. Group text, great place for that. Don't put it on Facebook. Group text is fine. Uh, Private discussion with, with someone you trust, great. But when you are with that person and you're hearing those things, obnoxious, ignorant, offensive, if you are if you are safe in that relationship and you are okay to continue and you feel like this is my work to do, we're just asking you to dig for that person's story because we can't really argue with each other's stories. We can argue with what we've made those stories mean for ourselves or for a larger population. I mean, a lot of what we're doing politically right now is extrapolating from our personal stories onto the whole world and deciding what I've made this mean, it must mean for everyone. Mm -hmm. And therefore, my position's right. So if we can just help each other with those backpacks, that unpacking process, how did you get here? Why is this so important to you? You know, isn't it interesting that we attended the same church and we see this so differently? Isn't it interesting that we grew up in the same house and we have a totally different perspective on this? Can you identify a moment where that you think changed your mind about this or that really solidified your support for this person or whatever it might be? Just getting into those stories is we have found the most sustainable way to keep those conversations alive. And then as Sarah said, having an exit strategy, knowing when to say, thank you so much. I am worn out with this. I bet you are too. Let's do it again sometime. So I think we're to the questions portion of the program. I was such a big talker. I said we were going to start this. I told Christy, I'm like, I bet we'll wrap up sooner so we have more time for questions. Thank you. Hi, I'm but Karen here we are. Salpi. Uh, you can email questions to askjseries at calvin.edu or use the hashtag on Twitter, askjseries. Or we have a technology called paper. And if you raise <laughs> a hand and you're in the room, an usher will bring you uh, something to write your question with. And I can read that. We love this part of the program. We love questions. I bet. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first question comes from a viewer, obviously. Uh, I'm having an issue with a particular friend regarding this issue of politics. In summary, they agreed to read each other's sources to try to learn and be uh-huh. open-minded. But, this will surprise us all, the friend now says, your sources aren't trustworthy. Yeah. What do you do with that? And I've had that same experience where uh, she labels it far left propaganda, even when it's a respected middle of the road news source according to all sides. I just avoid speaking now, not sure what to do. How do you reconcile that? We did a, a political exercise, we talk about it in our book called Exit the Echo Chamber. And what's really interesting is you have to be really careful with trading news sources because, and this is true for both sides, If people go all the way to the other side, it hardens their positions. It sounds really good. It sounds like it should open our minds, right? Um, But this is true for right-wing people and left-wing people. They go to the opposite side and they just shut down. Um, So I can tell you what uh, what I've been doing with with my father, who I like to send New York Times articles, and then he says, that's not a dependable news source. Um, I very, I, I switch tactics. I very specifically send him New York Times, and sometimes they're just opinion pieces that support 
like some of his worldviews and opinions. Mm -hmm. So like he lives in California. So literally anything in the New York Times that is critical of California, or, and there's some, been some really good writing, particularly from Ezra Klein, like pushing back on some of the California mm -hmm. policies, I send to him. I'm not trying to transform him into a New York Times writer. I'm just trying to say like, the New York Times is also not one thing, right? It's complex. It's an organization of thousands of people. It's, it's become this monolith, same with Fox News. It's the Fox News. But it's not. It's an organization of people. Um, and so, like, sort of opening up just a little room, I'm not trying to transform him into a subscriber. I'm just opening up a little movement. Yeah, it is such a bummer that this isn't a more effective strategy. It sounds so good. You read my stuff, and I'll read yours. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that I would add to what Sarah said is that this is another invitation to story. I like to ask people, like, well, who would you trust on this? And why do you trust that person? And when did you start trusting that person more than other sources? And could you hear a fact totally opposite to what you're saying if that person said it? What would that mean to you? Or, or do we turn on that person if they adopt this line of thinking? And if that's so, why? And what does it mean for us? We have a really good example of that right now. I mean, with Donald Trump going on some of the sources and supporting vaccines, like watching the reaction and watching yes. that play out in real time has been like, man, somebody should do a whole class on that. That's like a senior thesis. Confusing moment. You mentioned senior theses, and I was just thinking, um, as a teacher, it always interested me that um, English majors, whom I taught, uh, start, start a paper with a thesis, and your whole goal is to prove that right. And um, the secret is, if, if it's not right, you just change the thesis. So you always win. <laughs> Shh, don't tell anybody. Uh, and we live in a political climate where winning seems to be the, the goal versus science students who understood experimentation as being the goal mm. of discovery through mistakes. Why are we so afraid to be wrong? So a question um, comes, most of our politicians in Washington seem to be attorneys. They're conditioned to win or lose. That's what they do. To what extent does that carry over into political discussions? It's said that 80% of Americans agree on most things. Perhaps the win-lose issues are what help fracture those relationships. I'll let Beth start this one. So I'm trained as an attorney, and I have a very biased perspective on what it means to be trained as an attorney. And um, I think that there is, I think there's fairness in that idea of um, you get to a point where you are arguing to win. And that's what we see in our political discussions. I think what we're missing is the most frustrating moment for clients with attorneys, which is the very beginning of the case, when a client brings in a problem and an attorney's job is to offer an honest assessment of the case. People who have that legal training do have those skills, just like English majors have the skills, right, to contend with the best argument that contradicts the thesis. Um, we just need to go earlier in the process. And I think what's difficult is that very little in our political system rewards that. And we're putting that through a real stress test right now as we talk about the 2020 election. Uh, will voters reward people who have tried to do an honest assessment of, of what happened in that election? Will voters reward people who've tried to do an honest assessment of what's going on with COVID? Um, I think it's not that we have people with the wrong skill set, although I would certainly love to see a greater diversity of backgrounds in Congress along lots of characteristics, not just education and training. Um, but I, I hope that as a public, we can we can take a few steps back in that process too and say, actually, I don't want to win right now. I just want to, I want to establish some um, objectivity about what's going on and hear the strengths and weaknesses instead of the, the sales pitch. I also think it's like, don't hate the player, hate the game. I mean, there is a winner and a loser in election. It doesn't have to be that way. Like, we could think about different ways to run our elections. Ranked choice voting is a fantastic idea and a very interesting, um, you know, concept that some places are trying out. Um, but, you know, even in, like, my bipartisan commission race, which was not ranked choice voting, but you, you got four choices. You didn't have to use all four, so there was some more strategy than just winner and loser. Um, you know, until somebody finds a different way to run an electoral system that's not elections. Also, some interesting ideas about just lotteries. Bananas. But I love it. I'm like, yeah, let's just mix it up. Um, I mean, there is just an aspect of, like, winning and losing inside elections. And that ele winning, running and winning... And then governing, you know, not to quote Hamilton, winning is easier, governing is harder. Um, that there's just a, there's sort of an inherent conflict there, I think, as well. And you have to have elections that end at some point. Mm -hmm. I think this is a structural change we need to talk about. Having representatives 
have to run for their seats every two years the means worst. that those elections never stop. Yeah. Um, so I think there are places where we can we can change the game to incentivize more of the behavior we'd like to see from our representatives. Thank you. A student asks how to enter a politically polarized conversation. How to enter, and should I disagree with the people who are leading the group's opinion? Um, I mean, I don't think you should disagree just to disagree. I think that puts people in a defensive posture. I think often, you know, doing a little jujitsu, entering a conversation and being like, I don't really know how I feel about this yet, um, really throws people off their game. Or saying, I used to think this and now I think this. Or I don't, I, I, I've changed my mind. Or I just don't think there is, I mean, if you really want to throw people off of their game, there's a way to say, like, I don't know if there is a right answer here. I think that there is a lot of paradox inside this situation, and there's no easy way to reach an agreement. We're never all going to agree, so why are we trying? Um, is, a, is an interesting way, but it just depends. I mean, is this conversation happening in the classroom? Did you just, like, tap a person who's fighting on the sidewalk on the shoulder and try to enter into the conversation? I mean, like, there's a lot of context that I think is really important. My favorite expression is, can you say more about that? Especially when I don't know what to say in a discussion, just asking people to share more. I'll give you an example of a political discussion that I recently entered. Um, I've realized as a parent of two daughters in elementary school that I really wanna get more involved in the school system. I do not have strong opinions on things happening within the school system because I don't know about them. We received um, advice from Piper Parabo, who's an actress and activist. And she said that, that she was advised when she started becoming politically active to just show up for a year and listen before she started to engage in those conversations. And so that's been my approach with the school system. I'm just going to school board meetings and listening. I'm going to any kind of training session or open meeting that I can just to hear what's going on before I form any opinions and try to really inject my voice into those conversations. There's a way to participate without injecting your voice in, and maybe that gets to some of what the student's asking. I think there is definitely a time for just getting acquainted with what's going on and, and figuring out who you wanna be in that environment. And throwback to, we don't give congressional people that opportunity. You don't have a chance to rest and learn and participate as a congressperson. If you wanna read a wrenching interview, Representative Meyer, who came um, like on the events of January 6th and then voted to impeach and like his journey and how quickly he had to basically decide everything, like the second he got there. Um, now there's some you know, events of history that it doesn't matter how long your term is, but nobody with a straight face can look at me and say, if you've just entered a six-year term versus you've just entered a two-year term, that that's not gonna affect your decision-making around something like January 6th. Mm -hmm. This question, and I'm sure it can come from the other side too, a pastor asks, is it okay to be fully exasperated that a huge percent of Christians in America not only believe but are willing to spread a lie regarding the past election. I know we need grace, but maybe that grace is destroying the image of Christianity in our community. Mm. I mean, but, but again, right there, the image of Christianity, as if there's ever going to mm. be one. And, and I will say the question put Christianity in quotation marks, so right. he may be aware of that. And yes. I think that that, like, I'm just really trying to train myself how often the undercurrent of a question or a situation is there's one right place, there's one right way, there's one right image, there's one stance of this institution. Like it's always, it's just, it's like the matrix. Once you see it, you're like, oh, it's everywhere. <laughs> um, and so like, just release that. For, let's, before we talk about that, and there is a real conflict there, let's all let go of the idea that we're gonna settle on one image of Christianity for everybody. That's not the goal, it never has been, because it is unattainable. Um, and so I think that's the first step. Now, that being said, do I think that, do I think it is really, really problematic that, like, for example, the word evangelical is starting to be defined more politically than by, like, something as basic as church attendance? Yeah, I do. I think that's hard. That's something we're going to have to talk about. Um, and so I think that that is, you know, but I, I definitely think with religion, as much as I think that the, the sort of growing indelible nature of, of religion and politics, although, you know, we've got historians here at your university, I think, who would argue with that this is a new development, um, but that, that nature of that is, is inherently 
filled with conflict, but also can be a place of growth and connection. But we're not going to settle on one of those. It's, we're going to walk those paths simultaneously. And the more we can, ju- instead of fighting that reality, just embrace it, I think that we'll have more productive conversations. We'll have more productive changes inside these institutions. We'll have, um, you know, just better feelings about it as individuals. Um, to the pastor who asked this question, I, I am fully exasperated as well. So I, I share that with you, and it's something I just want to be transparent that I'm working on in myself. And uh, the advice that I talked about with the kangaroo is what I'm really trying to work on. It, it's what Sarah was saying. Instead of thinking about the, the biggest picture, uh, what feels g- good and sacred to me right now is working just within my church on just the question of what our community needs in this new phase of COVID. Uh, Sarah and I get asked a lot, you know, what's your favorite Jesus? And like, theologically, that's probably not a great question, but, <laughs> um, but I try to think about how can I be the Jesus that, that washes the feet of, uh, disciples who are just being so annoying, uh, <laughs> at a really critical time for him. Um, so that is a consistent vibe that, of the disciples. Annoying. Yeah. It is. So doing that, that really small localized uh, listening, what does our community need? Our, our, this tiny community right here physically, what does this community need in this phase of COVID? Feels like the closest I can get to, to washing feet. Um, and and that, that helps me, you know, calibrate my reaction when I feel that larger wave of exasperation. Well, and also the lesson is like, people do what you do, not what you say. People do what you show them, not what you tell them. Um, it's totally the most annoying lesson of parenting that I've learned in the 12 years of <laughs> parenting. It's the worst. Just do what I tell you to do, not what I'm doing. How hard is this? Um, hard, apparently. Impossible. Very hard. Uh, Impossible. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, do you want to end with a hard one or an easy one? Oh, a hard one, of course. <laughs> do you have advice for someone like myself who values character when I'm having a political discussion with someone who feels policy is more important than character? And again, a fundamental difference in foundational assumptions. Oh, Beth, why don't you kick that one off after I ask for the hard question? That's nice, Sarah. Uh-huh. I think that... I'm um, giving. I'm a giving person. The, the, the first question I would ask is whether that's a true binary. Mm-hmm. Uh, because at its best, policy, policy, I hope, is an expression of character, or, or at least an expression of prioritization of values. Um, Something that's been helping me recently is thinking about timelines. I love stories about space, okay? I was not mad at Time Magazine for making Elon Musk the person of the year. I know that is a very hot take that not everyone shares. But I love thinking about what else is out there and what does that mean for humanity and what does that mean about what it means to exist in this universe. I love it. I fully understand people looking at the James Webb telescope, which I think is just like a miracle, and saying $10 billion when there is this much suffering, how many people could be fed for $10 billion? How many people could be placed in housing? How much progress could we make on any number of of priorities? I totally get that. That future timeline is valid. That present timeline is valid. Uh, I don't tend to get into arguments about how history is taught in school but I'm finding some space for people on both sides of that debate by realizing that past timeline is valid. We need people who celebrate the past. We need people who reckon with the past. And so rather than just saying, fundamentally, I'm talking about character and you're talking about policy, I wonder if we could merge those two and maybe just think about how how and why are we prioritizing things so differently that it feels like we're beginning on different planets. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that, again, it's that matrix. We've decided there is a thing, that good character, that people arrive there and then they're done. I mean, maybe like Mr. Rogers, Jimmy Carter. I can name a couple. But like that we've all settled on. Those people have good character, Betty White. Um, You know, like, but it's so rare. Like, and I, I think we decided it's true for everybody. Character is a process, right? Just like everything else. And guess what else is? Policy. Policy is a process. And I think, you know, I try to step away from character. That's not a good place for me to be in as an Enneagram one. I have enough of that. I don't need to lean into that at all. Um, My favorite Jesus is the flipping of the tables. See, I don't need that. Uh, 
this is not a good, this is not good integration for me. Um, and so for me, I try to think about a term I learned in Mary Trump's book that was very helpful to me, which is psychic survival. That some people are functioning from a place of psychic survival. Now, some people are morally bankrupt and are doing it to make money. I can name some of those people too. I won't right now. But I think that some people, most people, it's just, it's a journey of psychic survival. And if their psychic survival is based on a particular worldview, um, a particular, particular position for them inside society, then like, it's very hard to fight with. I can continue to try. I have not found it particularly productive in my life, but you are welcome to continue on that journey. Um, but if I can see that, that what they're doing is a, is a matter for, of psychic survival for them, then I'm not like, I'm good, they're bad. Um, you know, I try to think about like, I always love this term. Oprah talks about low frequency people, which I think is just helpful. Like they're just on a different frequency. It's not good or bad, but on my frequency, I am hearing things that they literally cannot hear, not literally, figuratively cannot hear, you know, like that, that I am operating in a different, on a different plane. Again, it's not like I'm on the good side, they're on the bad side, but we're just on different planes where I have more available to me than they do. One of our favorite phrases at Pansy Politics is have the best day available to you because there is not a good day and a bad day. There is just what can you get through today? Your best day available to you if you've just lost, you know, your beloved to cancer is different than mine and that's okay. And we have to give each other grace for that. And I think when I can see everyone on a very human journey, carrying that backpack, struggling with their own psychic survival, maybe operating on a different frequency than me, um, then I can give a lot more grace. And it's not this oppositional, I'm good, they're bad. Whether I call that good, bad, policy, character, whatever words I use. We are out of time, but I want to thank the Henry Institute for underwriting today's presentation. Thank you, Beth and thank Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. everyone. Come back tomorrow. <laughs>